How many of you have been through therapy at some point? This is a safe place. I'm still in therapy, and at this rate, we'll be for a very long time. <laughs> Nothing but love from up here.、Um, well done, a lot of you. What is one of the first things you talk about in therapy? Yeah, the genogram, which is a part of what? Yeah, your family tree. You talk about your family of origin, your relationship with your mom. What was she like? What was that interaction like? What about with your father? Did you have a brother, a sister? Where are you in the lineup? Youngest, middle, God bless them,、um, oldest. Where are you in all of that? What was your childhood like? What kind of socioeconomic background do you come from? You talk about all of that. Why? Why, why rehash all of that? To get to the bottom of what? <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> mom and dad got frisky quite a while ago. Yeah. Yes. You go back to go forward. That language may or may not sound familiar. That's actually our next practice in March. We want to do this together at Bridgetown Church. You go back to go forward because the reality is that the present. Is shaped by the past. Put another way, who you are, how you relate to God and to other people all around you, how you think and feel, how you see life in the world, who you are is shaped by where you come from. Now, this is not a new idea. If anything, it's an ancient idea that we lost over time and is just now making a comeback through therapy and that whole movement. But the biographer Matthew, right here, in this two millennia old writing, starts off with Jesus' family of origin. And his agenda is to show you who Jesus is. We left off, we left off last week in verse 17. Have a look at the next line, 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Now, the word birth there is genesis in Greek. Anybody recognize that word from last week? Yes. It's the exact same word from verse 1. It's translated genealogy in verse 1 and birth here in verse 18. But remember, more literally, the word means Genesis or origins. In fact, if you have an NIV translation of the Bible, there's a footnote. Look down at the bottom. In mine, I read an alternate translation quote, The origin of Jesus the Messiah was like this. So we are about to read Jesus' origin story. What a new hope is to the Star Wars saga. What the Sorcerer's Stone is to Harry Potter. This is Jesus' origin story. Now, here, here's the key idea Matthew tells you Jesus' origin story, not just to give you background. Oh, he was Jewish, and his dad's name was Joseph, and his mom was Mary, and he grew up, he was born in Bethlehem, and then he grew up in a peasant village by the name of Nazareth. He was Afro Asiatic by ethnicity. Not just to give you background, he tells you this story to tell you who Jesus is. And out of that, who you are. Because here's the genius of the Gospel of Matthew and really of the Bible as a whole. The more we understand who Jesus is, the more we understand who we are. I remember when I was 18, 19, 20,、um, from my understanding, you become self aware between the ages of 18 and 22, which is why most of the dumb things we do happen before that. No offense if you're under 22, but you know it's true, or you will find out the hard way.、Um, and I remember in that kind of key transition moment in my life how helpful it was to mirror and mimic off my parents and my family of origin. And I'm a lot in particular like my mom. And I remember thinking, wow, my mom is really introverted. Oh, I, I crave time alone. Oh, my mom's a reader. Oh, I get lost in a book for hours at a time. Oh, my mom is a perfectionist. That's not fun. Oh, wow. I, oh, that's, I'm a perfectionist. And, and that's not fun either. And it was really helpful. The more I understood my mother, the more I understood my family of origin, the more I understood myself. Reading the Bible is kind of like that. As we get to know our Rabbi Jesus and through him, what he, who he called our Father in heaven, his name for God, we also get to know ourselves. We come to see our potential, who we could grow and mature into, and where we fall short of that 
potential. So here's the plan. Matthew breaks Jesus' origin story down into four short stories. We'll cover just one today for time, but this coming week, if you want God to love you more than just read chapter two or something like that, Matthew is really long. I did the math um, because I'm a perfectionist, because of my family of origin. I did the math on how long it would take me to teach through the Gospel of Matthew, and it was three to four years. So, um, out of love, we're going to skip a story here or there, okay? So, we're not going to teach through chapter two, so go ahead and read it. For today, let's work through chapter one from 18 all the way to the end, all right? Here we go again, 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah, if you want to know more about what that means, listen to last week, how it came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Okay, right off the bat, it's a weird story. If you're new to the Bible, you're like, wait, what? Uh, I don't think I buy that. That's okay, the Bible is odd on a regular basis. But one of the reasons I believe in the virgin birth is because this is just not the kind of story that you would make up. Anybody? This is just not, if you were going to fabricate a story about Jesus' origins to make him look good, this is not on the list. You would not make up a story about an unwed teenage girl pregnant out of wedlock with no way to verify the claim. This has a ring of authenticity to it. Now, at one level, this is a beautiful story, in particular at kind of a literary level. The word birth there, as I said, is the same word for Genesis. If you were a first century Jew, you would immediately think of the book of Genesis. What's the opening line in the book of Genesis? In the beginning, God what? Created the heavens and the earth. Then the next line is, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the what? Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Matthew is saying that in the same way that the Spirit hovered over the waters in an act of creation, that same Spirit hovered over Mary's womb in an act of recreation. Genesis, the first book in the Old Testament, is about the creation of the world and about how it all went belly up. Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, is about the recreation of the world and about how God is and will one day put it all back together again. And that's just beautiful. But at another level, this story is a tragedy. Keep reading, 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the Torah and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, Jesus, as you know, was not born in 2017 in Portland, Oregon. He was born into kind of the exact opposite culture in a lot of ways, into a hyper-conservative, patriarchal, honor-shame culture where sexual mores and the marriage system itself was very different from our day and age. For starters, marriage was arranged by your parents. Come on, parents. Who you married was thought to be way too important of a decision for a couple of amorous young ones to make all by themselves. And then there was a one-year betrothal period prior to the wedding called the Arusin. And it was kind of like engagement, but way more. During this time, you were legally married, and it could only be broken by divorce or death, but there was absolutely no sex. In fact, the bride and the groom weren't even allowed to be alone together at all until the wedding night. That was, in traditional Jewish culture, your first time ever alone with your husband or wife was on the wedding night. The woman was usually around 13 or 14 years old, and the man was usually a few years older because he had to save up enough money for the bride price. Now, in this kind of a hyper-conservative culture, how do you think that would play out? You're Mary, you're 13, 14 years old, you're over at your in-law-to-be's, you know, hut or whatever, and you, like, are over in the corner, Joseph, come here, come here, I, I need to tell you something. What, Mary? Like, I'm, I'm pregnant. You're pregnant? Well, I saw you making eyes at Benji the other day in the marketplace, you and Benjamin, or what was it? No, I promise it's not. I don't even get to hold your hand, and now you're pregnant. I promise. No, it's, it's God. It's, the, it's from the Holy Spirit. How do you think that would go over? <laughs> yeah, even in the story, Joseph does not believe her. Like right here in front of you, Joseph does not believe her, but still, he's a stand-up guy. We read that he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, Rather, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, under the Torah, adultery was a capital crime. And remember, um, any kind of sex outside of the marriage relationship in that 
betrothal period was adultery. But the Romans had stripped Israel of capital punishment. That's why Jesus is on trial with Pilate and not the Sanhedrin. So in Joseph's day, if you wanted to, you would hold a public trial against the adulterer, and if she, if Mary was convicted, you not only got to, you know, get your bride price back, but you also got to keep her dowry. That was the way the law worked. So this is a potential lucrative moment for Joseph, but we see his character shine right through. He absolutely says no to that, even though allegations of infidelity would haunt Joseph's family for decades to come, if you read the New Testament. Still, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But, 20, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Um, In Joseph's day, people did not have access to the Holy Spirit like we do today. So dreams were one of the main ways that God spoke to his people. And dreams dreams are still a way that God speaks to his people. But in this day and age, it was one of the main ways. And in this dream, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and he said, Joseph, son of David, from the royal line, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It's a real true story. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name, what? Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, there is a play on words here in the original language that is dramatic that we miss in the English translation. In Hebrew, the name Jesus is Yeshua. Can you say that? Yeah, and you're like, how do we get from Yeshua to Jesus? Well, it's a kind of a long story from Yeshua, and then Greek it was Iesus, and then in English it was just, hey, Jesus, whatever. We lost a bit in translation. But Yeshua is a compound word. Ye is short for Yahweh, and Shua is from a root word meaning to save. So Jesus' name literally means Yahweh saves or God saves. But then the verb he will save is from the exact same root word, Yosia. So do you see it there? You are to give him the name Yeshua because Yosia. You are given, give him the name Yahweh saves because he will save, and then we read, his people from their sins. Now, if you're a smart reader, you immediately think, okay, wait a minute, is the pronoun his people, is that referring back to Yahweh or referring back to Jesus? Who will do the saving? Will Yahweh do the saving or will Jesus do the saving? Exactly. Remember that for later. 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. This is the first of a laundry list of quotations of prophecy from what we now call the Old Testament or what Jesus or Matthew would have called the Tanakh or the law, the prophets, and the writings. This is from Isaiah 7. Quote, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, a Hebrew word which means what? God with us. Now, when Joseph woke up, I mean, wow, what a dream. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And that is how, Matthew is saying, Jesus was adopted into the royal line of the Messiah of Israel. Now, there you have it. Christmas in February, everybody. Now... This story is dangerous. It's really dangerous. Here's why. You know it already, or you think you know it already. Even if you did not grow up in a Jesus-following family, or if you don't have any background at all in the church, still you know the story because of Christmas, but it's tied in with Santa and Eggnog and Buddy the Elf. And the danger isn't just that, you know, familiarity breeds contempt and we grow numb and bored or even worse, sentimental. The danger is that we actually miss the whole point of the story. You see, that line that we read in verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Um, If you want to, in your Bible, highlight that, underline it, star it, circle it with lipstick, whatever, That line right there is essentially a one-sentence summary of the entire Gospel of Matthew. But the reality is that if you grew up 
in the West, if you were educated in any kind of a Western system, and in particular if you grew up in the church, we read that line in a very different way from how a first century Jew would have read it. So give me about five or ten minutes to nerd out on you. This is a great time to catch up on your email if you want. Please feel really guilty, um, but that guilt's not from God. It's just from me, all right? Give me a few minutes to frame up for you my best reconstruction of how a first century Jew would have read that line, and then we'll come back and talk about what it means for who Jesus is and who you are, okay? Yep, all right. In the opening line, if you were here last week, Matthew makes the claim that Jesus is, quote, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, meaning Jesus is the climax to the story of Israel. Now, if you are new to the Bible, here's my one-minute summary of the story of Israel, and out of that, the story of the Old Testament. So opening line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. First, he called humanity in the story to rule. So humanity, Adam and Eve, the archetype male and female, the mother and father of the human race, so to speak, he called to rule. That is exactly what it sounds like. It's king and queen language. He called Adam and Eve, or humanity, to be kings and queens, to rule over the earth in a life-giving way, to gather up all the raw materials of the planet and reshape it into a, quote, garden of Eden, a Hebrew word meaning delight, into a time and a place for human beings to flourish and thrive in relationship to God, first and foremost, to each other, and to the earth itself. Now, how did Adam and Eve do? Pass or fail? Fail. So then he called who? A man named Abraham, who then gave birth to a son named Isaac, who gave birth to a son named Jacob, who had a lot of sex with four different women, who gave birth to 12 sons, who became 12 tribes, who became Israel. So Abraham is the father, so to speak, of Israel. And the exact same call was on Israel. He said to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be what? A blessing. That's a Genesis 1 language. That's a Hebrew way of saying, I'm going to put the human project back on track through you. But how did Israel do? Read the Old Testament, pass or fail? Fail. So next God called the kings. First was a guy named Saul. He was a disaster. Then was King David. He was really great until about his mid-40s, and then there was a fiasco with a roof and a tanning incident. Um, then <laughs> King Solomon, and you have king after king. If you've ever read one, two kings, if you've ever read um, Chronicles, the Old Testament, it's this high and this low, and each king has a chance to become the Mashiach or the anointed one. Each king is anointed by the prophet with the oil of the Holy Spirit and has a chance to become the anointed one, but each king, a couple get close, but no cigar. No, but no king can usher in the kingdom of God. So how do the kings do, pass or fail? Fail. So finally, you end up in exile. All of Israel is dragged a thousand miles away into slavery in Babylon and is there waiting for the anointed one, for the Messiah to come from God and for the healing and the renewal, the end of exile and the kingdom of God. Now, two things you need to know about that. First, all sorts of good scholarship over the last century or more now has made the point that in the first century, in Jesus' day and age, even though Israel was back in the land, they thought of themselves as still in exile, in part because only two-thirds of the Jewish people were back in Israel. Um, should I say two-thirds? Only one-third was back in Israel. Two-thirds, the vast majority, were still either in Babylon or down in Alexandria, Egypt. There was a massive Jewish community or spread all through the Roman Empire. And secondly, even for the one-third that were back in the land, they were not in the kingdom of God. They were not even free. They had been under Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, and now they were under the boot of Rome, and it was anything but the kingdom of God, anything but righteousness and justice, that twin pairing all through the Hebrew Bible. So even though they were back in the land, they were still, at least the felt experience at an existential level, they were still in exile and still waiting for the Messiah to come. Second is this, they were still in exile because of their sin. Have a look at this prophecy about the end of exile from Isaiah 40. This is about the future from Isaiah's vantage point, and he writes this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, 
that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So, all that to say, in a first century Jewish mind, the salvation from sin was tied up with the end of exile and the kingdom of God. Notice that Matthew says he will save his people from their sin. Now, who are his people? Not a trick question. Who are his people? Yeah, Israel. How many of you are Jewish? Yeah, all three of you. Well done. Double blessed in the room tonight. Anybody thinking, what about the rest of us? I'm Ukrainian. Am I not in? I'm American. Am I not in? I'm Mexican. Am I, did I not make the cut for some reason, right? Well, if you know the whole story, if you save Israel, then you save the world because Israel was never about Israel. Israel was always about the healing and renewal of all of humanity. Matthew is saying that the exile is over and that the kingdom of God is here. All through that one line, name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, this drags into the light the very different way that we think about sin and salvation in the modern Western church than in the first century Hebrew kind of world. We think about sin, for the most part, as guilt or innocence before God. And if you come from a conservative background, salvation is about, quote, going to heaven when you die. But for the Hebrew writers of the Bible, from Moses and Genesis all the way to Matthew in the New Testament, sin was about way more than guilt or innocence. First and foremost, it was about a breach of relationship, and not just between you and God, between you and all the people around you, between you and the earth itself. And and salvation was about so much more than going to heaven when you die. It was about the healing and the renewal of your mind and of your heart and of your body and all of your relationships, first and foremost with God, but also with people around you, with humanity, with the earth itself. And it was about your community. It was about healing humanity of all evil, everything from injustice and violence and war to disease and poverty to the breakdown of the family and emotional pain, and it was about the healing of the cosmos itself. So sin is not less than guilt or innocence before God, and salvation is not less than a change of address when you die, but it is so much more. It is about the end of exile and the beginning of a whole new reality that is the kingdom of God. Now, with all of that in mind, let's talk about what Jesus' origin story has to teach us about who Jesus is. Put your email away now, by the way. And out of that, who we are. First, who Jesus is. Matthew is saying that Jesus is Emmanuel, or God with us, come to save his people from their sins. Now, This is a tough pill to swallow in a progressive, secular, modern city like Portland, Oregon in a year like 2017. We all know um, that the world changed in the 17th century with the Enlightenment. Prior to the Enlightenment, it was really easy to believe in guilt or innocence before God and that you need to be saved. It was really easy to believe in God and that he was involved in human history and his hand was all over your life. It was really easy to believe in a virgin birth. You would not bat an eye. But after the Enlightenment, after the 17th century, all that became very hard. Three things about the post-Enlightenment world that we live in that make it really hard to believe in the Christmas story. First is humanism. We, from birth, grow up in a culture that is passionate in its belief that we are born inherently good. To that I just say, have you ever been a parent? (laughs) And, And there's truth and fiction about that belief. There's truth in that every single human being, follower of Jesus, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, every human being on the planet is made in the image of God. You bear, whether you believe in Jesus or not, you bear the fingerprints of God all over your psyche, your mind, your heart, your body, your personality, your story, who you are. And that's true, and that's beautiful. But it's fiction because what's also true is that we're a mixed bag of good and of evil, and it's nature and it's nurture. And we all have a bent, a particular, before salvation, before we 
are moved by the Spirit of God. We all have a bent away from what is right and towards what is wrong, away from what is good for us, for the people around us, for our city, for our world, and actually toward what is evil for us, for the people around us, for our city, and for our world. There's a part of us that is crooked. As Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs right through the middle of the human heart. But because we don't believe that anymore in the West, in particular in a progressive secular city like Portland, because we don't believe in original sin, is what the ancients called it, because of that we have to blame shift all of the problems and issues of the world onto somebody else's fault. We have to go out and search for a scapegoat. So p the political world is a great example of this. Whatever side you come from, everybody is so mad right now. There is just anger that is insane, and it's always somebody else's fault. It's the Democrats' fault, it's the Republicans' fault, it's Obama's fault, it's Trump's fault, it's ISIS' fault, it's Muslims' fault, it's Christianity's fault. It's already somebody, always somebody else's fault. When was the last time somebody said, you know what, the real problem is me. The real issue is me. Vote for me, I'm the problem, you know? Like, <laughs> nobody would get elected with that. But the main problem in the world is not external, it's internal. It's not that we need to tweak our government or our taxation or a political theory or the system. The main problem in the world is the human heart. That's why the West, the left in particular, is so confused about ISIS because the thinking in a humanistic culture is that all people need is a little bit of education and socioeconomic equality and then everybody will just poof, turn into Mr. Rogers or whatever. And then you have ISIS, and the leaders of ISIS, for the most part, were educated at Oxford and Cambridge, too, the top-rated universities in the world. Most of the leaders of ISIS come from money, have wealth. That is not the issue, and they are leading genocide all through the Middle East. And so the math just does not up. So people, in particular in the West, just, scratch, just are absolutely confused. The second hang-up we have is liberal democracy. Now, I'm with Churchill, who said democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Meaning, I'm really grateful that I was born into a democracy. I'm really grateful uh, that I live in a safe city or at least in a safe part of the city. I'm really grateful that my kids grow up uh, and there's education and there's running water and there's... I'm really grateful for all that is good and beautiful and true about the United States. But I have a very realistic opinion of what democracy can and can't do. The New Testament's claim is that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was the turning point in human history, and I deeply believe that all of the weight of history, all the data and evidence is behind that claim. Imagine human history, imagine the last 2,000 years, imagine a world without the gospel of Jesus. I think what you see in your mind's eye is a bleak, toxic place, far more than the one we have now. But the claim of the Enlightenment and all of her children is that the 17th century was the turning point in human history. The rise of liberal democracy and science and medicine and technology and education. And now that we have all of that, we don't need your sin, we don't need your salvation or any talk of that. Christianity is part of the problem, not the solution. We'll take it from here, thank you very much. And we'll carve out our own little secular, progressive, godless utopia. We'll make the kingdom of God all by ourselves without the King. And so you have cities like Portland or San Francisco or Seattle or Copenhagen or Amsterdam, these little bastions of liberal democracy and hedonism and wealth and hipsters everywhere you go and great coffee. And, and what we're essentially trying to do is, is, is create our own little Garden of Eden, our own little kingdom of God, but without the, king, without the best part. And part of that impulse is right and beautiful and true, but the fact that it's empty, it's devoid of the meaning and the purpose that we ache for, that we crave, because you can't have the kingdom of God without the king. And we still think we can have it in the West. Even after 300 years of violence since the Enlightenment, more violence than ever before, even after European colonialism, after slavery, after the Civil War, after World War II and World War I, after the Holocaust and the greatest genocide of all time under progressive secular Russia, 60 million dead under Stalin alone, still secular society has faith that we can create our own little global, borderless, godless utopia and it's falling apart at the seams, particularly over the last few years. Education, the right government, equality and tolerance is not enough to usher in the kingdom of God. 
we can't save ourselves. I think, with all due respect to the Western world that I'm grateful for, it's hopelessly naive. The third hang-up that we deal with is secularism. We read a story about the virgin birth, and that's just the beginning, like, keep reading, there's more like that to come, and we think, really? Like, now we know better, as if people in the first century didn't know that, like, virgins didn't give birth to children. Like, <laughs> now, I went to PCC and have Wikipedia, now we know better. As if people in the first century didn't know that dead people, for the most part, stay dead. They don't come back three days later. It's like, now we have science, and now, we, like, I think people were well aware of that in the first century. Now, if you're a skeptic, this is a safe place, I mean, we'd laugh, but this is a safe place for you. Even Joseph didn't believe the story at first. So if you're like, man, I don't buy it, that's fine. Just suspend judgment, keep reading. I think that you will find Jesus of Nazareth more than compelling. And then you just have to start asking the hard questions. Does a virgin birth make more or less sense of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? In the meantime, for tonight, just ask yourself, what kind of universe do I live in? Do I live in a closed system where either there is no God or if there is a God, he, she, it, they, whatever, is far away and not involved in my life or human history, and I'm on my own, and I have to save my own life, my own city, and my own world? Or do I live in an open system where there is a God, and he goes by the name of Jesus, and he's not far away, he's close, and he's involved in my life, in human history, and he's ready, willing, and able to save and to rescue and he's one prayer away, closed or open. What kind of universe do you inhabit? What kind of worldview do you wake up in the morning to? What kind of narrative script do you live out? So, first off, what does this story about, say about who Jesus is? He is Emmanuel, come to save his people from their sins. Secondly, let's talk about what the story has to say about who we are. Who we are, we are people who need to be saved. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel all through the New Testament claims that all have sinned. That word sin has become a loaded religious word now. In Greek, um, it was not a religious word in the first century. It just means to fail or to screw up. How many of you have failed? Yeah, how many of you have screwed up? How many of you have made a mess out of your life or our city or your world? At least a time or two or a thousand. And the gospel claims that we need to be saved by something or somebody outside of us. I'm all, f I'm all for self-help. I, I, I eat that stuff up at Powell's. But tips <laughs> and techniques, I'm, I'm like a white guy. I'm like, oh, self-help, this is great. Um, <laughs> it's such a white privilege thing. You have to know that. I read that book the other day, Designing Your Life. I'm like, wow, only rich white people would ever write a book called Designing Your Life. I digress. Um, tips and techniques are not enough. A podcast here or there is not enough. A sermon is not enough. We need to be saved by something or someone outside of us, by Jesus. That's why the good news is that Jesus is a teacher, a rabbi, but he's not just a teacher. All a teacher can give you is knowledge. Frankly, I don't need that much more knowledge. I was born into the information age. I have way more than I know what to do with. I have millennia of all the best wisdom from the human tradition, from West, from East, from Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism. I have all of it one keystroke away. But knowledge is not enough to transform me. I need to be saved. I need to be moved by a power, by a person, from outside of myself. My problem isn't lack of knowledge. My problem is my heart and that it's bent in the wrong direction and I need it to be changed and I need it to be transformed. Jesus is not only a teacher, he's also a savior. He's Emmanuel, he's God with us, come to do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves, something for our city that we cannot do for our city, something for our world that we cannot do for our world, to save you, your city, your world out of the mess that we've made. What if we are a people in an open universe where God is as close as the air on our skin or closer, and we are a people who need to be saved, and God is a prayer away. Now to end, um, go ahead and just put your stuff away and 
when you're ready, just stand up. And I just want to lead you through a really short exercise. I just want to create space for you to ask yourself and for you to ask God and feel free to ask your community later on one simple question. Um, I don't have like a practical thing for you tomorrow morning. We're right in the middle of our practice around silence and solitude. Stay on that track. For tonight, rather, I just want to end with one simple question. Where do you need to be saved? From sin and its consequences in your life and the world. When I say sin, um, I don't just mean sin done by you, although that, of course, is right there at the forefront but also sin done to you when you were a child or this afternoon. Also sin done around you in your family of origin, in your apartment, in your workplace, in the world that you call home. Where do you need to be saved? All that word saved means is to be rescued. To be healed is another way to translate that. Where Do you need to be saved? Do you need to be rescued? Where do you need to be healed? Because the old way of being human, it just isn't working anymore. And you need a power and a person far greater than tips and techniques or a book or a podcast or a sermon or a church event. You need to be set free by Jesus.